Hi, Ms. Seglin here. In this video, I'm going to be reading chapter one of Lois Lowry's The Giver, but I am also going to be discussing vocabulary, plot developments, literary devices, and elements in the chapter. So I'm going to talk about just things that I would normally talk about in class and ask questions I would normally ask in class. Um, now these are going to be longer than the straight through audio version. So if you just want the audio version, that's fine. Um, go to that. I will link that in, in the description below. But without further ado, um, the first thing we would do when we are reading The Giver is look at the cover. What do we see? What does the title tell us? What do you notice? Um, obviously right here we see there's a Newberry medal little um, thing here. The book was written in 93. Lowry won her second Newberry. The first one was for Number of the Stars in I believe 1990. This was in 1994. Um, we have this torn photograph here. A lot of people usually notice this is black and white. This is color. Okay. And then we would typically talk about, you know, the genre of science fiction. This is soft science fiction, meaning she's not getting into the technology, but there are definitely elements of science fiction. Mainly this is set in the future. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to start. So chapter one, um, we'd probably also talk about utopia, perfect society, dystopia, a not perfect society, and talk about some of those um, concepts that we will see in the book. So chapter one, starting out, it was almost December and Jonas was beginning to feel frightened. No, wrong word, Jonas thought. Frightened meant that deep, sickening feeling of something terrible about to happen. Frightened was the way he had felt a year ago when an unidentified aircraft had overflown the community twice. He had seen it both times, squinting toward the sky. He had seen the slick jet almost a blur at its high speed go past, and a second later heard the blast of sound that followed. Then, one more time, a moment later, from the opposite direction, the same plane. Okay, so notice right here, when he says, you know, frightened was the way he felt a year ago, this is flashback number one. Okay, so we're seeing Jonas is trying to identify how he's feeling, and he's remembering a year ago when this plane flew overhead. Now, you should be questioning why would that make him so frightened? You know, what's the big deal? We have planes go ahead, you know, overhead all the time. Not a big deal. At first, he had only been fascinated. He had never seen aircraft so close for it was against the rules for pl pilots to fly over the community. So that would be something I question. Why? Why would it be against the rules? What rules? Occasionally, when supplies were delivered by cargo planes to the landing field across the river, the children rode their bicycles to the riverbank and watched, intrigued, the unloading and then the takeoff directed to the west, always away from the community. So I'm thinking, what community? What are they talking about? But the aircraft a year ago had been different. It was not a squat, fat-bellied cargo plane, but a needle-nosed single-pilot jet. Jonas, looking around anxiously, had seen others, adults as well as children, stop what they were doing and wait, confused, for an explanation of the frightening event. And in my head, you know, I'm picturing these people standing around, like, looking at the sky, like, what is happening? Then all of the citizens had been ordered to go into the nearest building and stay there. Immediately, the rasping voice through the speakers had said, leave your bicycles where they are. Okay, so I'm thinking, why are they riding bicycles? And where is this voice coming from? What is this voice? And we're still in this flashback a year ago. Instantly, obediently, Jonas had dropped his bike on its side on the path behind his family's dwelling. I'm thinking that's an odd choice of phrase, dwelling. I know that's a house, but... Why does he call it a dwelling? 
He had run indoors and stayed there alone. His parents were both at work, and his little sister Lily was at the child care center where she spent her after school hours. So I'm wondering why is this capitalized? Because it's not a specific child care center, but yet it seems to be. Looking through the front window, he had seen no people, none of the busy afternoon crew of street cleaners, landscape workers, and food delivery people who usually populated the community at that time of day. And again, I'm wondering what's with this capitalization. He saw only the abandoned bikes here and there on their sides. An upturned wheel on one was still revolving slowly. He had been frightened then. The sense of his own community silent waiting had made his stomach churn. He had trembled. But it had been nothing. Within minutes, the speaker speakers had crackled again, and the voice, reassuring now and less urgent, had explained that a pilot in training had misread his navigational instructions and made a wrong turn. Desperately, the pilot had been trying to make his way back before his error was noticed. So again, this is really confusing me. I don't know why pilots capitalized. I don't know what a pilot, you know, in training really is and why everybody is so freaked out a year ago. I, I don't know. And then what is this voice, you know, who is talking to this community? Needless to say, he will be released, the voice had said, followed by silence. There was an ironic tone to that final message, as if the speaker found it amusing. And Jonas had smiled a little, though he knew what a grim statement it had been. For a con contributing citizen to be released from the community was a final decision, a terrible punishment, an overwhelming statement of failure. So now things are just getting weirder and weirder. Even the children were scolded if they used the term lightly at play. Jeering at a teammate who missed a catch or stumbled in a race, Jonas had done it once, had shouted at his best friend, That's it, Asher, you're released. When Asher's clumsy error had lost a match for his team, he had been taken aside for a brief and serious talk by the coach, had hung his head with guilt and embarrassment, and apologized to Asher after the game. Now thinking about the feeling of fear as he pedaled home along the river path, he, rem he remembered the moment of palpable, stomach-sinking tear when the aircraft had streaked above. It was not what he was feeling now with December approaching. He searched for the right word to describe his own feeling. So at this point, again, there's another flashback while he's thinking in the flashback of this plane of when he got in trouble for saying to his friend, that's it, Asher, you're released. And he apologized, but he was really embarrassed, but it's showing us the gravity of what's going to happen to this pilot. So, you know, they're like exiled or released out of the community or something. We don't know. Jonas was careful about language, not like his friend Asher, who talked too fast and mixed things up, scrambling words and phrases until they were ba barely recognizable and often very funny. Jonas grinned, remembering the morning that Asher had dashed into the classroom, late as usual, arriving breathlessly in the middle of the chanting of the morning anthem. When the class took their seats at the conclusion of the patriotic hymn, Asher remained standing to make his public apology as required. Okay, so again, we have this odd public apology, which again would, is going to delay the class even more. But here we go. I apologize for inconveniencing my learning community. Asher ran through the standard apology phrase rapidly, still catching his breath. The instructor in the class waited patiently for his explanation. The students had all been grinning because they had listened to Asher's explanation so many times before. I left home at the correct time, but when I was riding along near the hatchery, the crew was separating some salmon. I guess I just got distraught watching them. I apologized to my classmates. 
Asher concluded. He smoothed his rumpled tunic and sat down. We accept your apology, Asher. The class recited the standard response in unison, meaning all together. Many of the students were biting their lips to keep from laughing. So at this point, a tunic would be like a longer shirt. You know, he would still be wearing pants, but it would be um, not like a dress, but it could be like almost knee length. Okay, I accept your apology, Asher, the instructor said. He was smiling, and I thank you because once again you have provided an opportunity for a lesson in language. Distraught is too strong an adjective to describe salmon viewing. He turned and wrote distraught on the instructional board. Beside it, he wrote distracted. Okay, so distraught, if you're like devastated, you're really upset about something. Distracted, you just lose your focus. So then... We're getting this other flashback about Asher's using incorrect language and what kind of person Asher is. Okay, so this is really like the third flashback. Jonas, nearing his home now, smiled at the recollection, thinking still as he wheeled his bike into its narrow port beside the door. He realized that frightened was the wrong word to describe his feelings now that December was almost here. It was too strong an adjective. He had waited a long time for this special December. Now, at this point, we have no idea what he is, you know, why, what's important about December. We, we don't know. Now that it was almost upon him, he wasn't frightened, but he was eager, he decided. He was eager for it to come, and he was excited, certainly. All the Elevens were excited about the event that would be coming so soon. So I'm wondering, what's an Eleven? You know, why is he referring to these Elevens? Okay, but there was a little shudder of nervousness when he thought about it, about what ha might happen. Apprehensive, Jonas decided. That's what I am. Okay, so apprehensive, I would define as being, you know, a little bit uh, nervously excited. Okay, something's going to happen. You're, you know, worried about it. Who wants to be the first tonight for feelings? Jonas's father asked at the conclusion of their evening meal. It was one of the rituals, the evening telling of feelings. Sometimes Jonas and his sister Lily argued over turns over who would get to go first. Their parents, of course, were part of the ritual. They, too, told their feelings each evening. But like all parents, all adults, they didn't fight and wheedle for their turn. Nor did Jonas tonight. His feelings were too complicated this evening. He wanted to share them, but he wasn't eager to begin the process of sifting through his own complicated emotions, even with the help that he knew his parents could give. You go, Lily, he said, seeing his sister, who was much younger, only a seven, wiggling with impatience in her chair. I felt very angry this afternoon, Lily announced. My child care group was at the play area, and we had a visiting group of sevens, and they didn't obey the rules at all. One of them, a male, I don't know his name, kept going right to the front of the line for the slide, even though the rest of us were all waiting. I felt so angry at him, I made my hand into a fist like this. She held up a clenched fist, and the rest of the family smiled at her small, defiant gesture. Why do you think the visitors didn't obey the rules, Mother asked. Lily considered and shook her head. I don't know. They acted like animals jonas suggested he laughed <laughs> that's right lily said laughing too like animals neither child knew what the word meant exactly but it was often used to describe someone uneducated or clumsy someone who didn't fit in okay so i'm gonna pause here you should be asking yourself why don't these kids know what animals are you know we have animals all around us and by the way why are they doing this ritual, okay, of talking of their feelings after their evening meal? Okay, that's very strange. Where were the visitors from, Father asked. Lily frowned, trying to remember. 
Our leader told us when he made the welcome speech, but I can't remember. I guess I wasn't paying attention. It was from another community. They had to leave very early, and they had their midday meal on the bus. Mother nodded. Do you think it's possible that their rules may be different, and so they simply didn't know what your play area rules were? Lily shrugged and nodded. I suppose. You visited other communities, haven't you? Jonas asked. My group has often. Lily nodded again. When we were sixes, we went and shared a whole school day with a group of sixes in their community. How did you feel when you were there? Lily frowned. I felt strange because their methods were different. They were learning usages that my group hadn't learned yet, so we felt stupid. Father was listening with interest. I'm thinking, Lily, he said, about the boy who didn't obey the rules today. Do you think it's possible that he felt strange and stupid being in a new place with rules that he didn't know about? Lily pondered that. Yes, she said finally. I feel a little sorry for him, Jonah said. Even though I don't know him, I feel sorry for anyone who is in a place where he feels stupid and strange. How do you feel now, Lily? Father asked, still angry. I guess not, Lily decided. I guess I feel a little sorry for him. I'm sorry I made a fist, she grinned. Jonas smiled back at his sister. Lily's feelings were always straightforward, fairly simple, usually easy to resolve. He guessed that his own had been two when he was a seven. He listened politely, though not very attentively, while his father took his turn, describing a feeling of worry that he'd had that day at work, a concern about one of the new children who wasn't doing well. Jonas's father's title was nurturer. He and the other nurturers were responsible for all the physical and emotional needs of every new child during its earliest life. It was a very important job, Jonas knew but it wasn't one that interested him much. Okay, so again, we're getting the impression that the whole family is going to rotate through and talk about their day and kind of share what has happened. What gender is it, Lily asked. Male, father said. He's a sweet little male with a lovely disposition, but he isn't growing as fast as he should. And he doesn't sleep soundly. We have him in the extra care section for supplementary nurturing. But the committee's beginning to talk about releasing him. Oh, no, Mother murmured sympathetically. I know how sad that must make you feel. Jonas and Lily both nodded sympathetically as well. Release of new children was always sad because they hadn't had a chance to enjoy life within the community yet and they hadn't done anything wrong. There were only two occasions of release which were not punishment. Release of the elderly, which was a time of celebration for a life well and fully lived, and relief, release of a new child, which always brought a sense of what could we have done. This was especially troubling, troubling for nurturers, for the nurturers, like father, who felt they had failed somehow, but it happened very rarely. Well, father said, I'm going to keep trying. I may ask the committee for permission to bring him here at night, if you don't mind. You know what the night crew nurturers are like. I think this little guy needs something extra. Of course, mother said. And Jonas and Lily nodded. They had heard father complain about the night crew before. It was a lesser job. Night crew nurturing, assigned to those who lack the interest or skills or insight for the more vital jobs of the daytime hours. Most of the people on the night crew had not even been given spouses because they lacked somehow the essential capacity to connect to others, which was required for the creation of a family unit. Maybe we can even keep him, Lily suggested sweetly, trying to look innocent. The look was fake, Jonas knew. They all knew. Lily, Mother reminded her, smiling. You know the rules. Two children, one male, one female to each family unit. It was written very clearly in the rules. Lily giggled. 
Well, she said, I thought maybe this once. Okay, so at this point, just to review, we still don't know what these rules are. And we have no idea, you know, what this um, night crew is and the committee that they keep talking about. We really don't know what's going on. But now the mother is going to talk about her job. Next mother, who held a prominent, meaning important, position at the Department of Justice, talked about her feelings. Today, a repeat offender had been brought before her. Someone who had broken the rules before. Someone who she hoped had been adequately and fairly punished. And who had been restored to his place, to his job, his home, his family unit. To see him brought before her a second time caused her overwhelming feelings of frustration and anger. And even guilt that she hadn't made a difference in his life. Okay, so we get the impression the mother is like some kind of judge. And we don't know what rule this guy broke. I feel frightened too for him, she confessed. You know that there's no third chance. And the rules say if there's a third transgression, he simply has to be released. Jonas shivered. He knew it happened. There was even a boy in his group of 11s whose father had been released years before. No one ever mentioned it. The disgrace was unspeakable. It, it was hard to imagine. Lily stood up and went to her mother. She stroked her mother's arm. From his place at the table, father reached over and took her hand. Jonas reached for the other. One by one, they comforted her. Soon she smiled, thanked them, and murmured that she felt soothed. The ritual continued. Jonas, father asked, you're last tonight. Jonas sighed. This evening, he almost would have preferred to keep his feelings hidden. But it was, of course, against the rules. I'm feeling apprehensive, he confessed, glad that the appropriate descriptive word had finally come to him. Why is that, son? His father looked concerned. I know there's really nothing to worry about, Jonas explained, and that every adult has been through it. I know you have father, and you too, mother, but it's the ceremony that I'm apprehensive about. It's almost December. Lily looked up, her eyes wide. The ceremony of twelve? She whispered in an odd voice, like shocked voice. Even the smallest children, Lily's age and younger, knew that it lay in the future for each of them. I'm glad you told us of your feelings, father said. Lily, mother said, beckoning to the little girl, go on now and get into your night clothes. Father and I are going to stay here and talk to Jonas for a little while, for a while. Lily sighed. Obediently, she got down from her chair. Privately, she asked. Mother nodded. Yes, she said, this talk will be a private one with Jonas. Okay, so that is the end of chapter one. And at this point, again, we really do not know what the ceremony of 12 is. So we have many more questions than answers at this point. But one thing we do know is this community seems very, very strange and has a ton of roles. So I'm going to leave it there and please give me a thumbs up and subscribe if you like the video. Leave any questions you have below. Thanks for listening.